It is the word on everybody's lips and has been for months now, coronavirus. We haven't seen an international response to a crisis on this scale before, one in which every single one of the world's 195 countries are at risk. Nations are closing their borders, halting flights, limiting social interaction and closing workplaces, except for the most essential. The world's stock market has tumbled and shows no signs of stability. These are unprecedented times when fake news and panic travel faster than the virus. This is Beyond the Headlines, and this week we're bringing you everything you need to know about COVID-19, what it is, how it spreads, and what you can do to keep yourself and your family safe. So what is it and where does it originate? Coronaviruses are not new. They are a large family of viruses known to cause illness in animals and humans. But COVID-19 is the newest strain of virus. Experts believe the virus may have originated from a seafood market in Wuhan. They say the virus may have transmitted to humans from bats through an intermediary animal. On March 11th, the World Health Organization deemed the outbreak a pandemic. There are now more than 118,000 cases in 114 countries and 4,291 people have lost their lives. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. And for something to be declared a pandemic, you have to not be able to trace the new cases back to the source, in this case, Wuhan, China. So how do you actually get coronavirus? Dr. Tariq Yarosevic from the World Health Organization explains. Either someone will cough to your face and droplet with the virus will land on your, on your face, on your mouth or nose, and that's how it will enter your body, or, which is probably more likely, the droplets from infected person uh, will land on a surface, you will then uh, touch that surface with your hand, then you will touch your face, and this is how you will get infected. We have been hearing case after case of people getting coronavirus. But would you be able to spot the symptoms? So you'll have a cold, you'll get better, and you'll get worse, you'll get better, then you get worse again. And so personally, I started with a cold. I got better from the cold, and that's when I was hit with the flu. Um, the flu symptoms, were, were, it was quite bad. I was stuck at home. I wasn't feeling very good. Um, but I got better from the flu. And from there, that, that's where the pneumonia stage hit in. Um, and, and that came very suddenly. Um, it was a case of, of going to bed and waking up, not being able to breathe. It scared me because uh, breathing's necessity to life. Like if you have the flu, you really you feel like you're going to die, but you, you're really not. But when your lungs get inf- affected, um, that's where it scared me, and, and I couldn't take a full breath. Um, and it, the breaths I did take, it sounded like I was breathing through a bag. That was 25-year-old Connor Reed. He became the first Briton to catch the coronavirus. The good news is, he recovered. Fever, dry cough and tiredness are the most common symptoms. Some people may develop aches and pains, nasal congestion, runny nose or sore throat. The symptoms resemble a flu, but in some cases, patients may experience breathing difficulties. However, some patients might not display any symptoms at all, called asymptomatic. According to the World Health Organization, 80% of the people who get the virus won't need any special medical treatment, but an unfortunate few will get seriously ill. Older people or those with underlying health conditions such as diabetes, high blood pressure or heart problems are in the at-risk category. There's currently no vaccine for COVID-19. However, the race is on to find one. The first human trial of a potential vaccine began on March 16th in the United States. The fastest effort to develop a vaccine was in 2015, when the world witnessed a Zika outbreak. It took about seven months. The question now is, can we beat that record for COVID-19? But in the meantime, prevention and testing are our best weapons of defence, according to the head of the World Health Organization. You can't fight a virus if you don't know where it is. We have a simple message for all countries. Test, test, test. A question everybody is asking is, what are the fatality rates? You may have heard a lot of numbers being bandied around for fatality rates. 
That's because it depends on how you calculate it. And it varies country to country with the number of factors coming into play. Estimates range anywhere between 0.7% to around 4%. A large part of this is due to the fact that we don't know how many people actually have the illness. Unlike other viruses, you could be carrying the disease and have little to no symptoms. Some countries may also be underreporting it. We asked science writer Simon Inks. The reason that the figures will wobble and continue to wobble and will change tomorrow is that every country, every health system is trying to get their own figures for their own population. And then they're trying to compare their figures to the population's in different countries. And that is, it's not impossible to do, but it's impossible to do quickly. The uh, World Health Organization revised the uh, case fatality rate recently to 3.4%. It's now dropped to 0.7% as, as we learn more. So we have to get used to uncertainty. It's not that answers cannot be gotten by science, but it's the fact that science is slow and getting an overall figure is slow and will always only be an average because different populations have uh, different numbers of young people to old. For example, Japan has an aging population, South Korea, which is rife with uh, COVID-19, but no one's really noticed, has a very young population. So there's a huge infection rate in uh, South Korea, but very few fatalities. Uh, we have to be calm around statistics. They're interesting, but these are figures that you should look at every month, not every week, and certainly not every day. Another thing that's often overlooked is recovery, and most people do recover. The vast majority of coronavirus cases are still active. As of March 16th, 38% of people have recovered from the virus, from a total of 218,631 cases worldwide. So, the biggest concern people have right now is what can they do to protect themselves and their families. Here's Dr. Tariq Yarosevich from the World Health Organization talking about how to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Well, what we are recommending uh, people are several things. First is really uh, hand hygiene because we know the virus uh, is being spread through uh, droplets from infected people. So basically washing hands is a really very efficient uh, way to prevent getting infected. So we want people to, to properly wash hands. Second thing is if you see that uh, there is a person who has respiratory-like uh, symptoms, uh, then uh, stay away, keep, keep the distance. So uh, if that person uh, is basically shedding the virus, that you are not at the distance uh, that may affect you. So keeping distance from people who are uh, having respiratory uh, illness-like uh, symptoms. Then third thing is that if you do feel that you are coughing, that you have a fever, and you think that you are uh, you have been exposed to COVID-19, uh, well, stay at home and and then call the uh, healthcare provider uh, that is nearest to you uh, and wait for uh, for them to give you further instructions. A constant emphasis from doctors and health practitioners around the world is that we should wash our hands with soap. In the absence of a vaccine. It is the single biggest defense we have. But how does such an everyday item kill a virus that has almost brought the world to its knees? Let's try to break it down. Some viruses, including this strain of coronavirus, have an outer wall made of fat molecules. This wall is attached with proteins that stick out like spikes. Something like a boiled egg covered with toothpicks. It's these toothpicks that allow viruses to infect cells. Soap, on the other hand, is made of needle-shaped molecules. Just like a needle, it has two ends. One end repels water and prefers fats, and the other end is attracted to water. When we rub our hands with soap, the water-shunning end of the needle pushes towards the virus's fat membrane. This attack is so sophisticated that the needle-shaped water molecules wedge in between the virus's fatty wall and rip it open. You may not realize this, but you may have actually scrubbed off the virus from your hands. To be effective in this battle, you must wash your hands for at least 20 seconds, scrubbing your palms, the back of your hands, 
under your nails and between your fingers. A handy trick is to sing happy birthday twice. Antibacterial hand gel is not as effective as washing with soap, but it's helpful when you cannot wash your hands. And there are other things you can do. According to the World Health Organization, it's not clear exactly how long the virus survives on surfaces, but it seems to behave like other coronaviruses. Studies suggest that coronaviruses may persist on surfaces for a few hours or up to several days. This may vary under different conditions, for example, depending on the type of surface, the temperature or humidity of the environment. The World Health Organization says that if you think a surface may be infected, clean it with simple disinfectant. Wash your hands or use an antibacterial hand rub after you sterilize. Avoid touching your eyes, mouth or nose. Another thing you can do is practice social distancing. This is where you keep at least one meter away from other people, especially those who are coughing and sneezing. This means no hugging, kissing or handshaking. Think of it like an arm's length and a half. But the key thing in dealing with coronavirus is not to panic. We have all seen the videos on social media of people panic buying in supermarkets. Dr. Thuraya Kanafani, a clinical psychologist based in the UAE, says panic buying is driven by the sense of control it gives in the times of crisis. So ultimately, I think one of the things that a lot of people are focusing on right now is this panic. And the panic is coming from a lot of unknown and conflicting messages that they're getting. A lot of people are panic buying because they want to feel that sense of control and they feel like they want to have um, or they want to feel like they have some form of um, control over what's going on. However, it's also this mass marketing, this idea of like mob mentality. You see 10 people go and shop for toilet paper. All of a sudden, everybody's shopping for toilet paper. So it's that herd mob mentality rather than the, the really rational kind of thought process. It is, however, wise to keep some handy emergency supplies and essential stocks at home as there is a chance you may have to self-isolate. This is where you quarantine yourself away from other people for a period of time. During this time, you should restrict contact with as many people as possible. If you have COVID-19, this includes your family or people living with you. Don't share cutlery or linen and have food delivered to you rather than using a shared kitchen. Even if you don't have the disease, self-isolation can help contain the pandemic. If enough people isolate themselves, the number of infections should slow down. With each individual minimizing the contact they have with other people, the virus cannot spread to others. People who are carrying the virus but showing no symptoms will be isolated from more vulnerable groups and the pressure on medical services will be greatly reduced. Many countries are looking to encourage or enforce social isolation. So, what should you stock upon if you have to self-isolate? We asked a self-proclaimed prepper or someone who prepares for all kinds of calamities. Ali Khwaja is based in the UAE. So, water is something that's going to take up space if you're planning to store for your use. Uh, I, I think just put a filter and have a little bit of reserve. That's a single most important thing that your body consumes and what you really can't survive out of. You can live without food for a while, but water is critical. Um, they estimate if you're going to be very, very conservative, you're looking at a gallon per day per person, and that adds up. Also keep in mind you need water to wash yourself, you need the water to flush the toilet, you need water to you know brush your teeth. So you use water in so many places other than just drinking that you don't realize it. I mean, if you've got vegetables, you've got to wash the vegetables. You're cooking rice, you need to put water in it. I know a lot of preppers are like, oh man, I'm just going to buy like 300 pack of uh, noodles. What do you plan to boil them in? You need water to boil them in. Things not to stock are perishable items. Okay, you know, you, you like your bananas and strawberries and, and apples, but they've got a shelf life. Bread has a shelf life. Um, I know a lot of preppers who will just freeze the bread and then they can thaw it out later in a, in a couple of days and whatnot and it'll just be fine. So think about in terms of storage, not to store on stuff that is perishable. It's really not going to last long, and that's not how it works. The purpose of the reserve is just to sit there, not something that you would consume on a daily basis. You would carry out life as normal in the event that something would happen or a lockdown or, or a quarantine or a curfew, whatever you want to call it. Now you have the reserve to lean on without getting into panic mode and running to the shop and you know to buy supplies and whatnot. If we look back at history, there have been medical crises and pandemics before. The Black Death, 
the bubonic plague, and from just over 100 years ago, the Spanish flu. As we battle COVID-19, you might have heard a lot of people drawing comparisons of this pandemic with the Spanish flu of 1918, which was thought to be the deadliest in human history that killed at least 50 million people worldwide. But was Spanish flu in any way similar to what we are facing today? We asked science writer Simon Inks. COVID-19 has absolutely nothing in common with Spanish flu. Absolutely none. Spanish flu was airborne. COVID-19 is spread by contact. Spanish flu kills between 10 and 20 percent of the people it infected. COVID-19 kills perhaps 0.7 percent of the people it infected. It's much, much less serious than Spanish flu. One of the problems with trying to say anything definitive about uh, epidemics is that not only do times change, but places change as well. The um, environment of the Spanish flu was one in which lots of people were getting together to celebrate the end of the First World War. Um, in Manchester, uh, there's a chap who was in charge of public health called James Niven. And he realized, and this is in the days before anyone knew that viruses existed, he realized that flu transmission must be spread by the air. That's unlike COVID-19, by the way, which is spread by um, human contact. And he was frantically trying to ban Armist Day celebrations in the city of Manchester. And uh, nobody listened to him. And sure enough, a couple of weeks later, flu cases spiked in Manchester and an awful lot of people died because Spanish flu could attack you in the morning and kill you by the evening. You'd be healthy in the morning and, and, and be dead by the next day. To understand the enormity of the Spanish flu, consider this. In the United States, the country hardest hit by the disease, the life expectancy in the year 1917 was 51 years. In 1918, it dropped to 39 years. We asked Simon Inks if there are any lessons to be learned from Spanish flu. There is one thing about the Spanish flu, and that's the fact that helping people is, wasn't then um, anything that the medical profession could do anything about because they didn't know viruses existed. We had no idea. So the burden fell on women, essentially, nurses, mothers, wives, carers, and they were the ones who were risking their own lives to look after the sick. So one of the, um, uh, one of the morals of uh, the Spanish flu, I think, was that um, we pulled together to treat and look after people during this disease. Nonetheless, it's down to people to look after each other. And I think it's worth remembering that this story extends beyond the headlines, that it is actually about families and communities and friends. What to do if you have coronavirus? If you suspect you have coronavirus or have come in contact with someone who has tested positive, the first thing to do is to contact your local doctor or local hospital. It's advisable to talk to them over the phone, as they will know best if it's necessary for you to go into the hospital and what risk you pose to the staff there so they can prepare accordingly. Avoid public transportation when you do go in, and if necessary, an ambulance should come to you. You'll be tested for COVID-19, but if you're found positive, you'll be quarantined. In these worrying times, it's important than ever to spread facts, not fear. Use trusted news sites and health organization websites to get accurate, reliable information rather than sourcing your news from social media posts or messages forwarded on WhatsApp. If you visit the national.ae forward slash coronavirus, we're running a detailed section with a live blog for all the latest news as well as explainers and tips for this challenging time. Thanks this week to Simon Inks, Dr. Thuraya Kanafani, Ali Khwaja and Tariq Yarasovic. We would love for you to subscribe to Beyond the Headlines for a weekly deep dive into the stories that matter. We were produced this week by Arthur Edison, Aisha Khan, Nilanjana Gupta and Vili Lowry. I have been your host, Sohail Akram.